Are you ready to talk about sex? That's what we're doing here. Uh, my name is Kelly Corrigan. I have written some books about big moments in family life, mostly my family. I have a TV show on PBS called Tell Me More, and I have a podcast that comes out every week called Kelly Corrigan Wonders. And my guests tonight are Christine Emba. She's a columnist at the Washington Post. She has written an astonishing provocation called Rethinking Sex. And she is a contributing editor to Wisdom of Crowds, Christine Emba. And my other guest is, been, has been writing a sex column since 1991. Uh-huh. <laughs> He's written six books, and since 2006, he's been hosting Savage Lovecast. He's also, along with his husband, Terry, the founder of It Gets Better, Dan Savage. Hi. Hi. Uh, OK, so let's assume that we all agree that we are driven to find belonging and to satisfy what people call skin hunger from cradle to grave. And then let's take your idea that for something meant to bring pleasure, sex is causing a lot of pain. What is good sex? What is bad sex? Whoever wants to go first, knock yourself out. I'm going to pass this to Dan, because he's the expert. No. <laughs> Your book begins with this uh, discourse about how much bad sex is being experienced by, by so many people, particularly women, in the way sex was kind of redefined, refashioned in the last 15, 20, 30 years while I was writing about it that whole time. <laughs> so I think I would toss to you to begin with. All right, I'm in yeah. charge. You go. <laughs> okay, what is, what is good sex and what, what is, is good bad sex? sex? Well, I think the first thing that we need to ask ourselves, what anyone should ask themselves when they're having sex, thinking of having sex, contemplating going out on the town, is what they actually want from their encounters. Um, and so in Rethinking Sex, you know, I talk about the reasons why people are kind of secretly looking for sex. You know, they say that it's just because of skin hunger, because they want to experience this sort of fleeting pleasure. But actually, people are looking for, many people, I won't speak for all people, are looking for some sense of intimacy, a sense of connection with another person, often a sense of being seen in some way, whether it's fleeting or for a lifetime. We as humans long for connection and to be treated with human dignity and seen as and appreciated for the people that we are. And of course, we like the good feelings that come with sex, right? But then what is bad sex? We hear a lot about bad sex. Um, there's, of course, sex that's criminal. And I started writing this book during the Me Too movement when we heard a lot about just really criminal sex, you know, actual assaults and rapes going on in hotel rooms. But there were also these instances of sex that weren't criminal but were, well, bad. It was sex that people, especially young women, were having that, you know, maybe they consented to, but they, they weren't really enjoying it. They consented to it for reasons that they weren't really sure of or didn't really agree with. And it was sex that made them feel used sex that made them feel treated like an object, sex in which they felt that their sort of individual personhood was being invalidated. And so I actually think that when we talk about bad sex, it's not so much like, oh, we like kind of rolled around and it was like a little bit awkward, but more something that makes you feel like less of a human being, less of a person. And it's alarming to me that after the sexual revolution, the feminist movement, when we ostensibly think that sex is getting a lot better, it seems that more and more young people in particular are having this bad sex. Even in the face of sex positivity and the consent movement. Right, exactly. Despite all of our talk of you know, empowerment and sex positivity, you know, more and more young women are feeling, and young men actually too, I interviewed both for my book, are feeling bad about it. And you also see this, you know, in statistics, I mean, one in three teenage girls has contemplated suicide. At this point is what the latest Pew survey showed, and for many of them, part of the reason was that they felt objectified or they had had a sexual encounter or what they described as a sexual assault that really hurt them. And that's, that's scary. That is not the direction we should be heading in. Yeah. Uh, when I think about bad sex, and when I, I mean, consent is a baseline. 
uh, consent uh, doesn't necessarily make what happens after consent good, but consent is uh, the beginning and not the end. But uh, I see a lot of sort of conflation or mixing up of sort of this retroactive feeling or retroactive reassessment of the sex we had that then we wind up feeling bad about it because of a, a desire for that connection, that intimacy. And also, I think, a kind of cultural prejudice that um, favors, I call it long-termism, that if you had sex and it led to something long-term, that sex that retro in the retroactively you can feel good about. Um, if you had sex and it didn't work out for whatever reason, and sometimes it doesn't work out because you don't connect. Sometimes it doesn't work out because you chose wrong. You had a good feeling about this person. You wanted to do this thing with this person. And through getting to know them better and having sex with them, you realized they weren't who you wanted. And even if in the moment you experienced that sex as positive, as a good, you look back on that sex because it didn't lead to 50 years and three kids. It, with this negative framing, and I think a lot of that negative framing of sex is a choice that we make, mm. where we feel like we have to have the decency to feel bad about sex that didn't lead to something long term. When we can, I think, have a conversation that I would love to not like shove your, what you're writing about in um, Rethinking Sex aside to favor, but I would love to add to Rethinking Sex, is this conversation about the validity and necessity of short term relationships. Mm -hmm because we talk about LTRs, and LTRs confer on sex this legitimacy, even uh, sacredness, but we don't talk about STRs. Most of the sex we have and most of the relationships we have are going to be in the context of a short-term relationship. And if we could talk about short-term relationships and the sex that might happen in the context of a short-term relationship, also as something that could be affirming, that could bring that kind of connection and intimacy, even if it didn't bring something that lasted for three decades, I feel like we might retroactively feel less bad about a lot of the sex that we're having. Because I do agree there's a lot of people out there who are feeling bad about the sex they're having. And some of that sex is bad because there was a bad actor, there was coercion, there was misrepresentation, um, there was usury, there was malice, <laughs> not usury in the lending money sense, right? usury in the somebody <laughs> using you and manipulating you to get you to consent that was meaningless because you had been misled. But there's a lot of bad sex that's just like not connecting and then feeling obligated to feel bad about it after the fact because it didn't lead to marriage. It didn't lead to forever. And I think if we could talk about STRs as potential positives, it wouldn't, there wouldn't be less of the bad sex that happens because there's bad actors and there's always gonna be bad actors. I think there'd be less bad sex that we feel bad about because we feel obligated to feel bad about it. We feel obligated to feel bad about it because it didn't lead to forever. This is a hugely personal question, but have you had sex that you have felt bad about? <laughs> of course. <laughs> I've, had, I've had sex that I felt bad about um, because it just didn't, it didn't feel good. Like, it didn't feel good in the moment. It didn't feel like I was clicking with this person. I had, I've had sex where I felt bad because I felt like that person was bad. Like, sometimes bad sex is done to you by a bad person. But sometimes bad sex is something you have together that you create together with somebody because you're just not right for each other. And it I'm doesn't- I'm really concerned about how much I'm nodding. Like, is it too much nodding or <laughs> like- I mean, that was- to stay neutral here, people. This is a safe space I mean, I think you write about sex. bad sex with a lot of nuance, but it was one of the things that I felt reading your book was, and, and some other things I've read uh, in the sort of space that you've written in, is there's always this sense that bad sex is something that is done to us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes bad sex is something we do with somebody. Do you agree? Yeah, I, <laughs> I do agree. I mean, to the first question, have I had bad sex? Like, yes. Um, who among us, I guess we have to say. <laughs> um, Not but, me. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but My husband's here, so it's... Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Safe space, but also, you know, safe. We're yeah. going to keep it safe for you. <laughs> I, I really agree, actually, with this idea of, you know, thinking about sex that's done to you, sex that is created with another person, and this idea that we have to kind of categorize. We're, we're taught to be ashamed of our experiences if they don't turn out in exactly the way that we've hoped. I do think that there has been more open conversation, actually, about um, relationships that don't necessarily lead to marriage or don't necessarily lead to some sort of long-term outcome. But, again, I, I think it's actually less about sort of the outcome feeling and 
the understanding of whether you were, you were seen and you were made part of the experience that you were having, that you had some say in what was done to you or that you co-created with or without or with you know, questionable consent. When it comes to the short-term versus long-term relationships, actually, I think that even my own thinking on this has actually evolved in the course of, of just writing this book, Rethinking Sex. I have this conversation that I recount in the book with a woman who is talking about a one-night stand that she has. Um, she gets pretty graphic. I, I heard that there's a child somewhere in this room, so I won't recount the entirety of the story. Um, but what she complains about is not that the sex was bad or even that it was rough, but that she didn't feel cared for in that experience, that she felt exactly as you were saying, Dan, that the person was using her. And as our conversation around her experience progressed and she was sort of processing this with me, we began to talk about love, actually. And, you know, she wasn't looking for spending the rest of her life with this, you know, one night stand that she met one night at a bar in Denmark. But she said to me after recounting this experience, can we not just love each other even for a single night? Can we not just love each other even for the 24 hours between, you know, today and tomorrow? Even if I never see this person again, what I want in this moment is to actually know that they were thinking about me as a person, that they were caring for me for as short or as long as we are together. And that was what was missing from her How experience. How do you be open to experience, if you don't mind me asking a question. Knock yourself out. Open to experience and open to that kind of like, I'm in Denmark for a night, you're in Copenhagen for a night, we're gonna have a one night stand and not risk making the wrong choice. Like I think sometimes the bad sex we have, particularly earlier in life, and a lot of the people you interview in the book are in their 20s and very dissatisfied, helps us hone our bullshit detectors, helps us figure out why we're having sex and why we're choosing to have sex and maybe become choosier. But how do you avoid those mistakes that can often make you, or where you get that wisdom that mm -hmm. results in better mate selection. Very few of us have sex one time with one person once when we're 18 and that's it and we chose right and that's forever. A lot of us through trial and error learn what it is we want. And if I can jump back for a second and speak up for sex positivity, sex positivity was never about anything goes and you should do everything. It was about letting go of that shame that you just mm -hmm. referenced as something that can warp people's perceptions and the choices that they make. And so I'm pro sex positivity and I've always defended a kind of permissiveness, but when you give people permission to do what they want, and sort of explicit in that permission, is to not do what you don't want. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you can only figure out what it is you don't want through trial and error. And in that process, you're gonna get banged up a little bit. And that seems to me part of the human experience of sexuality that can't ultimately be controlled for in a way that eliminates bad sex from our lives. No, so I think I actually, I actually really agree with you here. I think what you're making is a pretty fine distinction, though. I think you can talk about bad sex and bad sex, which, okay, that doesn't sound actually very clear. <laughs> <laughs> but I promise I will, I'll play this out. I mean, there is exactly what you say. There's, there's bad sex that you experience. You misjudge the person or the experience going in. You think it's going to work out, and it like doesn't work out. For some reason, Like the, the chemistry doesn't really match. And like, it's not great, and it's not something that you would repeat, and you learn that and you move forward. This is the human experience. We learn often from experiencing things. But I think, I would hope, and actually what I want for younger people, for my little sister, for like so many of the young women I've talked to just at Aspen this week, is we don't have to experience every dark, like most painful depth. There's bad sex where, you know, you try something with someone, and it doesn't work out, it, like you don't fit together, but you can leave the experience saying like, that was bad, but it didn't, it didn't invalidate me as a person. This wasn't an experience that made me feel less than, this wasn't an experience that felt that it took something from my dignity that created what um, the professor, the Georgetown professor, Robin West, called hedonic dysphoria. This idea that you have consented to something that you didn't really want, and then suddenly you feel unsure of whether you can trust your own self, your own body, your own decisions. 
then there's, there is like really bad sex, I think. There's, you know, there's bad sex that happens, and then there is bad sex that doesn't need to be as bad as it is, I think. That's sex that you go into and the person does not care about you at all, who just treats you terribly, you know? And I hear so many stories, again, sorry to the, the small child who is somewhere in this audience, you know, of women saying like, oh, I, I had this encounter, I thought this person was really nice, and then they started choking me out of the blue, and that was really scary for me, and I don't trust men anymore. I don't, maybe this is, maybe this is an optimist view, maybe this is naive of me, but I, I don't know that I want to sentence young women to, to having to experience that, to having to learn through like really bad sexual experiences that they should be scared, that they should hide their intimacy, that they should be ashamed and close themselves in. I, I don't want young women to have, sorry. Yeah, watch it. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about porn and choking. I, and I want to say that Christine says that images aren't just images, they're world making. But then you have said, Today's unspeakable perversion is tomorrow's kink is next week's good, clean fun. 13% of sexually active girls 14 to 17 have experienced choking. Your opinion is some things are in fact bad whether you consented to them or not. There are some things even consenting adults should not do. Do you agree or do you think desire is desire and it's unimpeachable? There are some things consenting adults should not be allowed to do. How is that enforced? How do you prevent consenting adults from engaging in activities that consenting adults wish to engage in, even if you disapprove? Um, what is erotic is really subjective. I've had De Dr. Debbie Herbenick from Indiana University on my show three times to unpack the research that she's been doing into this horrifying trend of people just like busting out choking during sex because it's been normalized by porn. So I think this is a problem. And I think, you know, if you're not sometimes changing your positions, you're not thinking and taking in new evidence, right? I used to get out there and say, people seek out the porn that appeals to their interests. I don't think porn shapes their interests. And I think that was true of people close to my age and older um, and I think that's less true of younger people who are growing up in an era of just ubiquitous, constant streaming pornography. And it is shaping desire and behavior and expectation, and not just the expectation on the part of a boy who might initiate choking in a sexual encounter without any discussion, and choking is never safe, and I, I don't think it should be a part of anyone's sexual repertoire. Um, but it's also an expectation that many girls have after having watched porn, that this is not only normal, but this is maybe something that I desire. Because when you look at the research, it's not always boys are just doing this to girls. It's girls are asking for it. And sometimes initiating themselves, choking, the, choking boys. And what do you do about this? How do you put the porn genie back in the bottle? We need comprehensive sex education. We need sex education that says, um, Porn is to sex as action movies are to Tuesdays. Like, <laughs> and that consent, that, that, that there's degrees of intimacy, degrees of danger, degrees of risk, there's varsity and junior varsity, but we can't just live in a world where we like wish other people's kinks away. Because what we know about kink from research by you know, people like Justin Lee Miller, is it's not just men bringing kink to the bedroom. Like, lots of women are kinky, too. And kink isn't something that men are, and, you know, I'm gay. Like, kink is not something I've ever done to a woman. It's not something that, that women don't have these desires as well. So it's not just like porn is, like, introducing kink into these tabula rasa innocents who would just be having vanilla heterosexual missionary position intercourse if it wasn't for the, all this damn pornography. Power differentials are... You know, there's that thing that's always attributed to uh, Oscar Wilde that he didn't say, that everything in the world is about sex, or everything in the world is about sex, except sex, sex is about power. And one of the interesting things about human sexuality, because we're so obsessed with status and who's up, who's down in power, is that when power isn't present in a sexual encounter or a relationship dynamic, people will make it up and we'll play with it, which is a lot of what er the eroticism of power is about. We eroticize our fears, and we have a lot of fears around powerlessness and vulnerability, and people will, 
cops and robbers for grown-ups with your pants off plus orgasms. That's what kink is. <laughs> I, when it's practiced well and in a healthy way that makes people feel seen, that makes people feel valued, that makes people feel like their dignity has been honored, which can, can happen in a kink context. Someone's dignity and their personhood can be violated with missionary position, vaginal intercourse in a long-term relationship. No somebody's, question, no question. Somebody's dignity, value, humanity can be recognized, honored, and they can leave the experience feeling better in a, like in, in a dungeon in Berlin. That, that can happen. <laughs> Again, who among us? Right? Uh, no, but again, I, I actually don't think that we're necessarily in disagreement here. So I actually want to circle back to a comment that you made briefly about sex positivity um, and being in favor of sex positivity. And I'm really interested in this concept of sex positivity and what it has sort of turned into and what it actually represents. One of the things that I explore in Rethinking Sex is this question of what the feminist movements and the sexual revolution, you know, what they were actually going for, what they were searching for, and whether we have achieved what they promised or if we have kind of veered a little off course somehow. And I feel like actually the conception of sex positivity is one of those areas where we thought it was going to be one thing, and then it has turned into something else. You know, like the original feminists, the original sexual revolutionaries were sex positive. Like that was actually a term that had a very specific meaning and context. Um, it was a statement that actually sex was good, that women should be able to and allowed to enjoy sex. It was actually coined in an essay that was um, by Ellen Willis, I believe, when she was writing against the idea of political celibacy and political lesbianism, this idea that to be good feminists, women should just stop having sex or stop having sex with men. And she was like, no, actually, sex is good. I am pro-sex. I am sex positive. But I mean, I observed, I'm a millennial. Like I, I observed this sort of growing up through my childhood and then adulthood. The idea of sex positivity went from oh, women should also be allowed to explore their bodies, to understand sex, to not be ashamed of it, to being sex positive means that you too are a playboy bunny. Being sex positive means that you, as a woman, to be a good feminist, have to be up for it, have to be up for everything, willing to have sex with anyone at any time. You should be like a sex in the city girl. You should always be out on the town. And if you're not having sex, for whatever reason, it means that secretly you hate sex and there's something wrong with you. You're not modern. You're a repressed evangelical or something. And I don't actually think that that's particularly positive. And I think that that, that norm that was created, I think, in opposition to what sort of the original feminists, um, the original thinkers wanted, has pushed women into a new box and has pushed men into a new box where to be sex positive again, you can't be sensitive. You can't want a relationship with a girl. Mm -hmm. You should be a man on the town. You should be, you know, racking up the notches in your bedpost. You shouldn't care. What's your body not count? Caring. Yeah, what's your body count? Today, yeah. Which freaks me out. <laughs> well, this it, sort of right? takes us to apps, which someone that you interviewed for the book called Zappos for People. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, or Tinder was like a, a pizza delivery, actually. Mm -hmm. and, and before Tinder, it was... What was really remarkable for me as a gay man was to watch Tinder and these straight hookup apps take off and really recreate in a lot of straight people's lives what Grindr and before it Craigslist had been in gay men's mm -hmm. lives. Because when Craigslist came along, it, it's the reason why a lot of gay bars with back rooms and bathhouses closed was suddenly your apartment could be that bathhouse where you could mm -hmm. have anonymous sex with a million people if that's what you wanted to do. Um, one of the ironies for me is like somebody's been writing as long as I have is gay men hated me first because they thought I was sex negative. <laughs> because I said to gay men in the 90s when the consequences of contracting HIV were much direr than they are now, that it was possible to have too much sex and have too much sex with too many people. My position in the 90s um, was that straight people needed to have more sex than they do and gay men needed to have less sex than we can. <laughs> and that there was some that there was some balance there between straight people who I thought 30 years ago were really kind of sexually deprived and stunted and gay people who it was, I'm a Mary Poppinsist. She said, <laughs> enough is as good as a feast. You have to know when to like push away from the dick buffet. And a lot of gay men, <laughs> 
<laughs> didn't know when to push away from the dick buffet. One of the things I thought was so smart, and in, in a way right now about your book, Dangerous, for you to write about, was when you said, and I think this is really true, it became, you know, feminism, men and women should be equal, was conflated with men and women are the same. Mm -hmm. and experience sex in the same ways or should with male sexual experiences being the, the normative right. standard. And that, I agree, has been bad for women. And if you want just sl slam dunk evidence that men and women are different and experience sex differently, don't look at straight people, look at lesbians and gay men. Right. Because lesbian sex culture and relationship culture is very different than gay male sex culture. And it's about sex, it's about biological sex and the differences. And so part of what I felt reading your book was despair for straight people, how sad, because there's a kind of fundamental <laughs> sexual incompatibility there. And yeah. how do you as straight people bridge that? I mean, this is, this is like a real question that I hear a lot from like gay friends, like, are the straights okay? <laughs> like, what's, what's going on with you guys? Are you okay? And there's actually a term that's been coined for this, heteropessimism that's actually usually, you know, young women being pessimistic about their heterosexual experience and sort of wishing that they could just be lesbians because that would be easier than like trying to deal with straight men and trying to deal with the sexual culture. And I think you're also totally right when it comes to stats. There's another one that I cite in my book, a survey of college students, like thousands of college students. And the question was asked, um, do you wish that you had had, that you could have more one night stands, more casual sexual relationships? And 25% of men, like 25% of straight college males, and I think like maybe 24% uh, percent of gay college males said yes. And for women, it was 4%. <laughs> and for lesbians, it was like 2%, actually. And there's this, there's this total mismatch. But again, this idea of sex, positive, po sex positivity that says to be sex positive, a woman should be as sexually out there as any man and compete on that level means that often women feel like they should be acting in a certain way that isn't actually in line with their desires and doesn't get them or really their partners to the relationships that they really want. There was a part of the sex positive movement, even like uh, the, the open or poly movement too, that became prescriptive. Mm -hmm. That people who were, had more sex than people were supposed to have were shamed. And they turned that around to know you're doing it wrong. And you see this now with some people who are advocates of openness or polyamory, saying to people who are, want monogamy or advocate monogamy, no, you're doing it wrong. And I do think some people wound up making choices they wouldn't have made sexually to prove their bones, right? Mm -hmm. To prove which side they were on. And that's not a great reason for any individual to person sex, to yeah. choose to have sex. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to throw out there about heteropessimism is these w straight women who wish they were lesbians. There's these studies now in Denmark where they've had same-sex marriage the longest, and lesbian relationships are the most unstable. Lesbians are the most likely to divorce, followed by straight couples, least likely gay couples most likely to be non-monogamous gay couples, less likely straight couples, most likely lesbian couples. Okay, I'm gonna so, tell my friends. So <laughs> th th these women who wish, you know, who think their lives would be easier if they were lesbians because relationships would be easier, actually the, the data we have on the longest term relationships in places of marriage, this is long termism on my, of my own, I'm kind of pushing right now, s says actually straight relationships are more stable than lesbian relationships. And you're not really a bi big buyer on monogamy. No, no, uh, but, but I'm for monogamy. I just want monogamous people to be realistic about what that means. It doesn't mean you aren't gonna wanna sleep with other people. It means you're not gonna sleep with other people. Um, and if somebody makes a monogamous commitment to you and they only cheated on you twice in 50 years, they were good at monogamy, not bad at monogamy. <laughs> And I average it out, yeah. I, mean. I don't say that to monogamous people because I want, if, if that's so that your monogamous relationship survives the almost inevitable infidelity that's coming your way. Mm. There's a, I can't remember her name, the sex researcher who said, and I think quite accurately, every monogamous relationship is a disaster waiting to happen. <laughs> because infidelity. Do you, you feel that? <laughs> Because if you define infidelity, yeah. the infidelity is unforgivable. All the husbands are like, no. Definitely not. No, ever. I do not. <laughs> I mean, this is what I see straight people doing right now. Define 
infidelity is unforgivable, or define cheating is unforgivable, define everything as cheating, and then wonder why you're single again, Mm -hmm. right? There's cheating is cheating, pornography is cheating, thinking about somebody else is cheating, having a work husband or wife is cheating, texting an ex on their birthday just to say happy birthday, thinking of you is cheating, everything's cheating. And if if cheating's unforgivable and everything's cheating, then of course you're single still, or again. (laughs) I don't quite know what to say to that, Dan Savage. <laughs> I'm thinking. My wheels are turning. I want to put two quotes together from your book and then ask you to comment. Bad sex can leave you feeling violated, sick, confused. There isn't anyone to blame. No one forced anyone to participate. You could have said no, and you didn't. You didn't have the words or you didn't have the courage to say them. It doesn't necessarily traumatize you, but it can stick with you. A moment of embarrassment or regret. You try not to think about it, you do your best to brush it off, maybe even joke about it with your friends the next day at brunch. Too much of the time, bad sex is the norm for young women, not the exception. And in our society, women are conditioned to take responsibility for the feelings of others, especially men's. We teach women not to make a scene, not to be difficult, selfish, rude, to modulate their behavior into what is socially acceptable. They're trained to get comfortable with their own discomfort. And women are afraid of men. And men are scary, testosterone-soaked dick monsters. And women (laughs) who sleep with men should be afraid of men. And how do you control for that? Like, I I think a big part of the... uh, What I've found myself saying to a lot of the straight guys that I talk to who call into my show or write me is that in some ways getting that yes that you write about, getting consent, isn't enough because it may be coming from a place of fear mm-hmm. of not feeling able to say no. So it's not enough to get a yes, you almost have to beg for the no that might be lurking behind the yes. Do which you think if someone's horny, they're not necessarily gonna be able to do. I also though think when I read that in your book, we should encourage a culture also of resilience. You can have bad sex, and you can understand it as this thing, this wound that's gonna be open forever, that, or you can understand it as a scar and, that, and something that you can learn from and make different, better choices for yourself going forward. Like when you say that you can leave a sexual encounter feeling stripped of your dignity or like your humanity, is not your dignity and humanity something internal, something that someone cannot acknowledge but still is yours and that you can, it, are you encouraging a sturdier resilience? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that ideally that is the case, of course. Um, and ideally people, you know, I actually think that this is, a, this is maybe a, a different panel, actually. But especially in younger generations, there's a sort of creation of identity. And you think of, like, what parts of your life you want to create your identity from. And perhaps slightly too often, a sense of victimhood Um, or the harm that has been done to you is used to create your identity. You don't term yourself, you know, hi, I am X person, like I'm I'm great at soccer, like I really love reading, it's hi, I'm this person, I am a a victim, I am a survivor of sexual assault, and this is is now my life story. And I, I don't think that that is the healthiest way to move through life. That said, I think especially for, you know, a lot of the the young people who I'm writing for, you're at the very beginning of your identity formation. You're trying to figure out who you are. And, you know, your your sense of self, your sense of dignity that you're trying to build can be built up, reinforced, or torn down. And it's in the beginning where it really matters. And when someone violates your dignity or you feel that 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 dignity has been violated. Again, this is, I quote Robin West a lot here. Um, it can often end up creating a sense of self that thinks like, well, I'm, I'm a person who can be easily violated. Like my feelings actually don't matter that much. People will use me and I'm gonna get used to that. That's, that's what life will be like for me. And that is, I don't think that that's something that we should say it's okay to learn you know, early on or, or say that that's acceptable. That said, I do think that there are ways that you can move past disappointing events, move past harmful events. And I think one of the, one of the uh, things that kept cropping up in this book and in interviews is I talked to young women who had, you know, and young men who had had experiences of sexual assault or even, you know, consensual sex that wasn't bad is sort of the backdrop that they were thinking about themselves, 
their personality, their experience against. There were, there's a real and distinct difference between people who were able to say like, you know, I had this experience and I talked to my mom about it, or I talked to my dad about it, and they reassured me that I was still the sex positivity movement is the reason so many people can talk to their mothers yes. and fathers now and about sex in a way they didn't used to be able to. Right, and we also have to be able to have this conversation in the open. So not just have a bad experience and then like hide it in your heart and never speak about it again, but have it continue to shape your psyche moving forward. But actually be able to have a conversation of, you know, these things happen, we want to make them better. You are not the only one that something bad has happened to and like you can also move past this. But there has to be reinforcement from the outside from our, from our schools in a comprehensive sex education uh, you know, setup where we talk about what good relationships look like, what bad ones look like, how you move from one to the other. Would that sex education include bad sexual experiences are part of sex? You are going to have bad sexual experiences. Yeah. Just like you're going to encounter things when you watch pornography that are distortions and shouldn't be the way you conduct yourself. I always say to young people when we talk about pornography, like, I can find it very, it can open somebody's eyes if you say to them, what do you think happened right before that? Mm. Before the, they started filming? And a light bulb goes off, oh, they had a conversation, they, they talked about it, right? And then the problem with a lot of the sex that people have when they become sexual actors, they don't talk about it. And that's a straight problem too, because straight people get to consent and stop talking. Mm -hmm. Gay people get to consent and we have only just begun to talk because what's going to happen next isn't, can't be assumed because of the plumbing, right? But, that, but bad sex is going to happen to everybody and we should have a conversation about bad sex before we become sexually active because it might in the moment then make us more resilient or give us the tools we need in the moment if it doesn't feel good, if it feels like I it's know. bad or getting worse, to end it. But then we need a cultural shift between men and women because women often don't feel safe saying no, ending things because of the monsters men are. Do and I don't know what to do about that. that it's, I have two kids, two girls. Do you think that that's the message is you will have bad sex in the way that Christine defines it. You will have humiliating sex. You will have sex with people who do things that you don't really want to do, who aren't reading the signals, who are, have decided that since you consented, hey, all bets are off, let's get to it, and I'm going to do it my way, and I'll see you never. No. Like, is that, what I, is that what I should say to my girls? No, I don't. I'm not saying that, like, that kind of violation. You just mean, like, boring sex or... Or sex you feel bad about, or sex that wasn't good. Like, I, this is the problem. I think a lot of, like, mediocre sex that if you had it to do over again, you wouldn't do it is getting, like rounded up and tossed in with the r true violation, mm -hmm. like yeah. awful sex with bad people. But there's right. always gonna be bad people. You might have one or two experiences where you find yourself by your own choice in a room with somebody who's treating you that way. Then what? That's what a sex education would do. And then what do you do at right. that moment to extricate yourself from that? Do you think there's a way in which the emphasis on consent has totally minimized and reduced sex to like an arrangement, an agreement that we're gonna make and that we have accidentally thrown shade on the possibility that it could be something kind of wonderful and intimate? I mean, it, yes, yes and. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, you know, when we think about consent, first of all, we have to acknowledge that consent is, is really good. It's really important that we're actually able to talk about Consent is a thing that you need to get before having sex. Um, you know, marital rape was only outlawed in like the last U.S. state uh, less than two decades ago. Um, so just the fact that women can say like, "You need to ask my permission to do this," is actually that was a hill that we had to climb, and we shouldn't, you know, negate that. That said, consent, I think, and I, I keep saying this, consent is a floor. It was never meant to be a ceiling. If you think about how sort of the idea of consent originated in, you know, like political liberalism, consent was a legal terminology. It was sort of a risk avoidance mechanism. Like once two people, ideally two people who come to some object with the same sense of freedom, uh, agree to an exchange on these terms. They've both consented to this. That's what consent is. And it's, it's like a, a bartering exchange that you have 
both agreed to on the set of terms. And I, I think that most people want more from their sexual and romantic encounters than to think of them as like a handshake bartering agreement where both people kind of tried to get the best of the other, but you know they evened it out at the end. I think we want more from sex than this was consensual, which is to say this was not actually a criminal act of rape. I think we all want better than that. And, and we sometimes get better than that. Like a lot of the sex that people consent to in the moment often leads to lasting, loving relationships. And you're always taking a chance, and it's always a, a bit of a bungee jump. And individual results may vary, even with the same person. Like one person might have a wonderful experience of that person, somebody else might have a bad experience with that person. And this is like setting aside violent, sociopathic, bad actors, right? But I, I wanna like rise in defense again of sex positivity, because the people who get to consent and stop talking are the people who haven't gotten the message around sex positivity being about advocating for yourself in the moment and being able to say what it is you want and don't want and what it is you want to share and not share with a particular person at a particular time. The people I see who get to consent and stop talking are often women who are with men that they're afraid of, don't be with those guys, but often people who are very kind of sexually repressed or still struggling with shame, who yes is the only word they can force out of their mouths. They can't say yes and then what they want because they can't even articulate what it is that they want. They're hoping that other person can guess. And when you empower somebody else to guess what it is that you might want, because asking for what you want, particularly if you're a woman in a culture that slut shames women, who know what it is they want and will advocate for themselves, that sets you up for violation, even from a person who wasn't setting out to violate you. And, and that often happens in sexual relationships, where somebody's like, I don't want to ask for what I want, I just want this other person to know. <laughs> and sex should be impulsive and spontaneous. And that's not, that's a Russian roulette sex. That's dangerous sex. That's where people set themselves up for failure. And sex positivity that wants to get people to be able to talk about their desires and their interests and advocate for themselves in the moment beyond consent is the corrective for that. For all of those circumstances where you're not with a bad actor, not with a sociopath, having bad sex with somebody that's not making you feel good because neither of you said it is, said out loud what it was that would make you feel good. So I think I want to complicate that a little bit though because again, I think this is a place where we kind of agree, but maybe have almost minute differences. So first of all, this idea of sex positivity, you know, empowering women, empowering men to say what they want, to know what they want, to be able to ask for it and advocate for themselves in the moment. I think that's good. I think that's really important. I think that we should be training young women and men to actually be able to read their own emotions and desires and speak up for themselves. At the same time, I think that we, we are human and I think it's really easy to overestimate our ability to know exactly what we want at every second, to be brave enough if you're, say, a young woman in a situation with like a bigger, older man who, yeah, you might be afraid of just for reasons of like size differential, to be like, ah, now I know what I want and I will speak up for myself. If you're like, I don't know, an 18-year-old college freshman, like, is that, should that be the requirement for you to have good and not scary sex that you have somehow grown into this person who knows exactly what to do in the moment? And so I think, I think that the ideal of sex positivity is incredibly important to be, to be very clear, like I agree with you on that. But I think we also have to, to look for ways to make sex good, sort of ethically good and morally good that aren't responsible for each person sort of taking aside having a perfectly built wall at every moment. And so in rethinking sex, I, I suggest again that you know consent is necessary. It's necessary, but not sufficient. It's the floor, but it's not the ceiling. And when we're thinking about good sex, you know, we're thinking not just about sex that's, that's pleasurable, although like, you know, hopefully it's gonna be pleasurable, but sex that is ethically good, kind of morally good. And but I who makes that standard? And one person's pleasure is another person's, what the fuck is that? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Well, so this, is, so, this is the other, so this is the other part of the equation. Like, what do you do past consent? Like, okay, let's assume you're getting consent. What should your responsibility be to the other person in your encounter? And I suggest this ideal of willing the good of the other, which is simply, you know, trying to, 
And no one actually succeeds at this because you, you simply can't be the other person. As you said, you can't just make decisions for the other person. But trying to keep in mind, keep in your, in your spirit that the other person is a person who is as human as you, as necessitating of human dignity and good treatment as you are, to value them in a sexual encounter as much as you value yourself, to will their good. And the second part of willing someone's good is not just saying like, oh, that's another person too. It's also actively trying to seek out their good. And I think actually you gave kind of a, a great example of this, the idea that you, know, you shouldn't just stop at, especially if you're a man, stop at, well, she said yes, so you know, let's just keep it moving but actually seek out what the person really wants. Like, in some sense, perhaps try and get to know them but and that, figure out what, whether it's <laughs> no. I feel like there's a tremendous amount of work to compensate for the fact that people are having sex outside of relationships. Yes. So if you're in the context of a relationship, the person probably does know what you want. And you don't have to contractually agree to every next move. Like, can I put my hand here? Can I put my hand here? Like, but we're going around the bend to make it work out for people to have casual sex safely but in a way that doesn't damage. Hold your tongue, young man. <laughs> and um, I just wonder if there's any part of you that thinks we should have less casual sex. Like, we should probably encourage young people to try to keep sex more or less in the context of a relationship because the odds are that your dignity will not be so at stake, that it will not be this like move by move contractual arrangement where you're like signing a piece of paper, consent. You can touch my boobs, consent. You can touch my ass, consent. Like, it's not like a lot of paper on the floor. It's I, very messy situation. I don't no know. Wants. Is anyone else feeling that way? Like I'm, I'm wondering. I yeah. mean, so, Honestly, yes, and this is something that I, that I say in the book. And actually, Dan, I think that this is something that you've stated really well. You know, the more sex that you have with, you know, the greater number of strange people, the more strange beds you tumble into, the higher the odds are that you're going to tumble into bed with somebody who doesn't care about you, who will treat you poorly. And so when you're making the calculations about how much casual sex you should have, think about how likely you are to encounter somebody who is actually thinking of you, caring for you. And if you're looking for a real relationship, if you're looking for actually that intimacy, that literally love is what most of my interviewees, you know, when I talk to them, when, when I ask them what they wanted from their sexual relationships or their time on Tinder or whatever, you know, they weren't saying like, I'm looking for a hot night of fun most of the time. Like actually they, they would sort of say that, but then finally say like, I'm, I'm looking for someone who cares about me. I'm looking for a relationship, I'm looking, I'm looking for love, I'm looking for care, I'm looking for emotionality. And if somehow, that's what you're looking for, then maybe having sex with a bunch of strangers is not going to get you there. How many people though, the, the, that sex in the context of a committed relationship right. where there's intimacy, how many of those people who are in those relationships was the sex the first night casual? Like you're reverse engineering from long-term committed intimacy and suggesting that casual sex never leads to that, never results in that. And at least among my friends, and I'm not talking about my gay friends necessarily, most of the people I know who are straight, Seattle, of course, it's a <laughs> subculture, who are in long-term committed relationships, it was a hookup to start. And then because it, they weren't having casual sex with just anybody, they were picking they were being picky, but they had casual sex with people they thought maybe they could see themselves with. I mean, that's, I had a lot of like bad sex when I first started like having sex with men when I was a teenager. And then eventually I was like, you know what? I'm only gonna have sex with guys that I could see myself being, them, them being my boyfriend. And that didn't mean I couldn't meet somebody and make that assessment in like an hour, because <laughs> I could. I would get a good feeling about somebody. Sure. But I didn't like, think he's hot, I have a bad feeling about him, I'm gonna fuck him anyway. <laughs> I did that a few times when I was like 18 and I learned my lesson and I stopped. Mm -hmm. But like, my husband is somewhere here in the room, we've been together almost 30 years. It Where was, are you, say hi. Wave. The, 
we made out in a bathroom in a gay bar. The, the <laughs> morning after he came home with me, he was in the shower and I had to get his driver's license out of the wallet in his jeans to know his name again. <laughs> by the time the next morning had come around and he'd gone to take a shower, I'd forgotten his name. And there he is. Yeah. Like, and I don't think that's unique to us as men. I'm sure there are some straight couples in this room who had very sleazy starts. That yeah. is something that exists in the universe and it has to, I think it has to be allowed for in your philosophy. And if we can allow for that, but in, there's a kind of casual sex that's impulsive and probably self-destructive. And as a gay man, I've certainly seen friends fuck themselves to death. I think that's a thing that people can do. They can destroy themselves with sex. But there's a kind of casual sex that's open to moment, open to possibility, yeah. open to chance, and yeah. open to connection, whether that connection lasts until the next day or a couple hours or winds up being through kismet, something that lasts for 30 years. I don't disagree with you. Uh, we have 11 minutes left and I know you want to ask questions, don't yeah. you? Okay. I have a whole box. A basket of, of questions. Uh huh. Let's see what we've got here. And if you're nervy and you just want to stand up and ask one, by God, do it. How to approach parenting late teens, 17 to 20, in a sex positive way. You looked at me. Um, <laughs> I think there's a certain sex negativity that parents owe their children, just for, for <laughs> Now that is not what I thought you were gonna say. <laughs> for boundaries, like when I was growing up, we called them the nudist parent, even if they were fully clothed. There was that parent who was too comfortable talking to their kids about sex, right, right, right. and their kids' friends about sex. Like, there needs to be like a no man's land between parents and kids about sex. You want to make sure your kids have all the information they need to protect themselves, to protect their partners, to make good choices, and to know that they can come to you in an emergency, but otherwise you don't... My mother used to say, There's a thing, there are things a mother has a right not to know. <laughs> and I think that that's healthy. So make sure your kids are smart about porn, smart about consent, smart about... And that means forcing the conversation. Like, they may not have gotten a good sex education, so you have to say, we're gonna talk about this, and your kid's gonna go, I know about this, and you're gonna go, but I can't know for sure you actually know, mm -hmm. so we're gonna talk, I'm gonna download. And do the download about consent, do the download about safety, safer sex, protection, and I think the emotional stuff. Like, I talk about, I've been, as long as I've been saying BGGG and like, do for your partners and meet what them. What is GGG? Uh, good giving in game. Good in bed, giving of pleasure, game for anything within reason. I've also always mm -hmm. promoted the campsite rule, which is leave people in better shape than you found them. Mm -hmm. Whether you were with them for an evening or with them for a decade, you should leave someone in better shape than you found them. And I think that's something that you can tell your kids and then say, and I don't want to see your browser history. And I don't need to know the details. I feel like the campsite rule really resonates in Aspen, Colorado, actually. I That's think right. we're, we're all in the outdoors. People we really that. got that. Yeah. But I mean, I guess actually, um, sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in on this one because I think Please. it's really important too. Um, in Rethinking Sex, I talk about my own sort of sexual evolution. I grew up in a, a very conservative family where just we didn't talk about sex. Like I never had a sex talk with my parents. And then, you know, after going to college, after living in the world, it, a certain point I had experiences and I was like, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me any of this? And I had like a really intense discussion with my mother about this and it was really wrenching for both of us. And I think- What did she say? She, she said, I thought you would figure it out. I thought you had a boyfriend, I thought you knew. And my parents are like um, Nigerian immigrants, like very conservative Christians. And just like that wasn't, that wasn't a thing that they talked about. And I think the friends I have who have survived like the best in what is not a great sexual culture right now are the friends whose, whose parents maybe gave them the download, maybe didn't do so as explicitly, but also made it clear that that was something that they could talk to them about, that they were open to having that conversation and that they accepted their child no matter what. And then they were the ones who also sort of affirmatively reached out to check in to see like, how are things going? You had this experience, but know that I still love you. Know that I support you no matter what. Know that if you want to talk to me about sex with your new boyfriend, you can always come talk to me. And then the daughter's like, I definitely don't want to come talk to you about that. Please stop talking to me. But then in a crisis, they, they know that they have somewhere to go. Yeah. And yeah, having the conversation very early on, not waiting until, okay, it's a night before you go to college. Here's the sex talk. But actually beginning to talk about what does it mean to be a good friend, to be a good partner, 
when you're a kid and all the way up means that that's, that's seated in you from the very beginning. You don't have to learn it late. I just want to say that for everyone who blew it, I, my mom said, do you have any questions? And I said, what's a douche? And she said, you don't need to know. <laughs> and everything's really worked out fine for me. <laughs> so the other thing I want to say is what I said to my girls, which they would just kill me for saying this out loud. So if you ever meet them, I said, you get yours first. Mm. That is great advice. And if you get yours first, he's a good guy. <laughs> it's a thought. How can you build a better relationship with sex when it's painful for you? Physically painful? Mm. I don't know. It doesn't say, and I wouldn't dare mm. call anybody out. Have you had it, questions it it, like this on your it pod? It depends on how, uh, often when someone says sex is painful for me, they mean penetrative intercourse is painful for me. There's a lot that I think should count as sex that's not just penetrative intercourse. If sex is painful for you, I would, uh, I would at first want to know what you mean by sex. Um, I think the broader our definition of sex is, the better our sex lives will be, the more sex we'll wind up having, the less we'll feel obligated to do perhaps the definitional things, whether it's vaginal or anal intercourse, that sort of get centered, um, and the happier we'll be. So what does sex mean for you? What's possible for you erotically? Uh, what's possible for you with intimacy? Can you define that as, also sex, or sex too, or sex period, or sex for you, and then maybe sex will not be so painful. I generally think when it comes to sex, we need a broad definition, and when it comes to cheating, we need a narrow one, which are <laughs> things that I think are in conflict, to find cheating narrowly, and you're less likely to get cheated on, to find sex broadly, and you're likely to have more and better. That's a good answer. Anything to add, or are you good? No, I think that's great. Um, someone wants to know how to keep a healthy sex life in menopause. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I, I'll say that I don't have personal experience in that yet, but actually I think I, you would, I would throw that I out have to no what? personal experience in yet. <laughs> fair. Okay, fair point. <laughs> no, but I, I, I do think that actually the answer maybe throws back to the answer that you just gave about painful sex. Like, how can we broaden the definition of what is erotic? of what is intimate. If there are things that are painful or harder for you at like a certain point in your life, you can still be close to your partner. You can still be close to other people. There are other methods that you will want to practice, but you just have to realize that, that is, that's part of sex too, that it isn't less than what you used to do or less than what your partner deserves. You're still having sex or having intimacy in a way that works for you and that's still really beautiful. And read Dr. Jen Gunter's book on menopause, because mm. I think she... Yeah. I, read I also that, heard a, about a product it. called Vela. My friend told me that I have to get it all women over... Do you know Vela? Sorry, I didn't mean to call you that. <laughs> <laughs> the danger of sitting in the front row. I know. Uh, this is a great question. What advice do you have to a couple where one spouse is much more sexually adventurous than the other, but very compatible in every other way? Open relationship. Dan, mm. go ahead. I see. <laughs> tell them all. Tell them your whole theory. You know that some people are sexually adventurous. That means like there's a kink or a kind of like power dynamic they want to explore, something they want to do that you don't want to do. It can be a source of conflict in your relationship forever that they don't get to do that thing. Now, there's a price of admission. Like sometimes we don't get everything we want. You pay the price of admission. You ride the ride. Um, and you don't complain about the price of admission. If you're not willing to pay the price of admission, you don't ride the ride. Uh, so sometimes, you know, I don't think everybody gets everything that they want, but if there's something your partner wants to do that's very important for their sense of sexual fulfillment, and vanilla people can often look at kinks and think, why is that important? It is, because it is, because kink is a kind of sexual orientation. Uh, I can't remember, <laughs> anyway. If you don't want to go bowling with your partner, let them go bowling with somebody else, right? And if there's something that they're into that you're not into, and it still reserves for you things that are important to you or sacred to you, like va vaginal intercourse or intercourse, but your partner has a foot fetish or your partner wants to go to a BDSM club but just do bondage, like, let them. Like, uh, that's... I can, can tell by this person's handwriting that they're not going to let them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay, then 
then own that your partner is. <laughs> then you know. <laughs> then don't ask your partner to. Pre- don't ask your partner to pretend they haven't made a sacrifice for you to be in the relationship. Don't ask your partner to pretend that there isn't a stone in their shoe and that they're not sometimes unhappy about this. Yes. Let them grieve it. Yeah. Like, and, let, and take the compliment. Being with you means I never get to do this stuff, but I choose being with you. Mm-hmm. But I'm sad sometimes about not getting to do this stuff. But you don't get to like say to your partner, you have to pretend or not have the feelings that you feel that are complicated mm-hmm. or that give me complicated feelings about it. And I, I also think that there's, there's a larger question when we think about relationships and actually what we, when we think about what it means to like live a good life or be in a good relationship. And I think in the modern era, we tend to think being in a good relationship or being happy means that every desire that I have, I get to fulfill. And sometimes we don't get to fulfill all of our desires. Sometimes we don't get to do everything that we want to do, whether it's out of respect for a partner who is not going to allow us to do that, whether it's because it's impossible, whether it's for some other factor. And that is actually okay. I think a constant focus on my personal happiness at every moment of the day leads to deleterious effects in all sorts of ways, whether it comes to sex or anything else. And we need to remember that we are not the only important thing. And take ownership of our own prioritizing of our own desires. Like I have this desire for X, but I also have this desire to be with you and that's more important to me. And rather than resenting you because I don't get to do X, I have to take ownership of the fact that like my greater desire, that one I'm prioritizing is to be with you. So it's not just like, I have unmet needs, I don't get everything I desire. Like you're getting a bigger thing you desire yeah. out of the relationship. And if it doesn't feel that way, maybe you should get out of the relationship. Mm. Christine Emba, Dan Savage, thank you very much. Thank you. I want to sit here for the next.